But uh, we're all here right now, and I wanted to talk about something that I feel like is, is really important as Christians that we often, uh, sometimes we can overemphasize it um, to an extent without making it real in our lives, and that's simply um, studying the Bible, <laughs> um, studying God's Word. And I think that we live in a day and age and where we don't realize how spoiled it is that we are in our knowledge in general, right? When you think about um, at the time of Jesus, young, young Jews, they would have the Torah memorized, you know? The whole first five books, they would have that memorized, you know? Um, and I think that if someone asked, you know, maybe someone asked them a question, you know, what does this say there? Um, they'd probably, they probably be able to quote it, but if one of them asked you the same, if I said, if I told you, I'll pick on Eric, um, if I said, Eric, you know, what does Exodus chapter one, verse one say, could you probably tell me, could you figure it out? Not on the top of your head, but could you get the information? Oh, yeah, right. You could, right? How? Yeah, you got a Bible, right? And now we've got digital access to them. Um, so basically, we have all this access information, um, but it's not it's maybe not on the top of our minds all the time, but we've got it. In reality, we have greater access to God's Word than any other age in history. Um, and I think that sometimes we don't realize it, but we can get kind of gluttonous on God's Word. Um, sometimes, uh, as Christians, oftentimes our answer, as we read the Bible, as we talk about what does this mean for us in our lives, I loved what Eric said this morning about discipleship and the call to action, but sometimes we talk about what does it mean to be a Christian, uh, we give some kind of uh, easy, easy uh, answers that are normally the same things. You know, it's like, what do I need to do as a Christian? We normally say, you know, read the Bible, <laughs> be sure to be reading your Bible. Um, what else do we normally say? Pray. <laughs> what else? <laughs> There's like two more things I'm really thinking about. We normally say, pray. Go to church. Go to church. And then I'll, I'll throw it in there, don't sin. So normally, no matter where it is we open up, um, we, we look at it, we read it, and we go, oh yeah, this is really good. We know tons about it. We know, uh, we know original root words from Hebrew and Greek and all these things. And we study it. We read all these books from a thousand years ago up till now. And, but we come away with, what does this mean for us today? And it's read more of it. <laughs> uh, we need to pray about it. And we need to go to church. And, and don't do bad things. <laughs> but really, these are basics, right? Um, being a disciple is much more than that. It reminds me of Jesus with that rich ruler, right? He says, he says what do I need to do to inherit the kingdom? And he asked, them, he asked him about, you know, how is the law? And he says, oh, those, that's child play. He says, I've kept that since I was young, right? It's kind of like this. Um, but when Jesus calls him to really give up what was taking hold of him, could he do it? He said, go and sell everything you had. Could he do it? No. He walked away sad. So what I want to talk about this morning is how does this become practical? And about looking at God's word in a way to where um, we're looking at it for direction and application. Because, uh, because in English or in America, we say where the rubber meets the road, basically. Like, where does this touch down for us and our lives today? So we know... We know that God's word is a powerful thing, right? Turn with me to 2 Timothy in chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses uh, 16 and 17. Paul tells Timothy, he reminds him of this. He says, all scripture is inspired by God. If you're reading the NIV, it'll say, all scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Um, basically, Paul is reminding Timothy that God's word is useful. Um, he's saying God's word is about what is going on here and around us. Um, but I think that sometimes, uh, sometimes we forget this. We, we almost get in this habit of studying God's word for the sake of just studying God's word. And it's good that we need to grow in our knowledge and our understanding, but as well, we need to make it real for our lives. So I want to talk about uh, three steps for what formerly is called inductive Bible study. 
And that just means um, how to study the Bible with just the Bible. Um, and I believe that this is something that, that is important for us to unleash in the church because uh, we all as Christians need to, one, uh, be edifying ourselves. We need to be feeding ourselves spiritually, right, as individuals. Um, but also, we need to be coming together in groups where we can encourage one another. Um, we need to be in situations where, where we're hearing um, from each other what we see the scripture as saying. So I want to look at three steps, basically, today um, to unleashing God's word. Um, so the first step is, is to check it. Um, we say check it. I'll just put them all up here. Check it, eat it. And then thirdly, we're going to unleash it. Um, so what these three steps are is as we, as we check God's word, one of the things to remember is almost as we, as we open up God's word, to an extent, we're, we're taking a time jump, right? We're traveling back in time the, to the earliest state of 2,000 years, right? So things are very different. We need to understand some context there. And we're also doing a cultural hop, right? Um, if I step off the plane into the Philippines, is that world a different world than here? Um, are th do things mean something different there? Um, I realize uh, here's a little example of a cultural difference. Sometimes there might be things in the Bible, and because of their culture, it won't make sense in our culture. Or some things that might be seen good in their culture might be offensive in our own culture. The other day, I was visiting some of our Pakistani friends, and we were talking about things, and I said, um, I said, okay, we said, like, we agreed on this, this thing. So we're friends, so I said, we promised this together. So I'll do it with Brad as an example. So I said, okay, Peaky promised me. Make an example. I said, all right, Peaky promised. We're good friends, right? And so we went like this. And then they, their eyes freak out. They open up. Do you guys do Peaky Promise in Philippines? Or in, have you guys ever heard of Peaky Promise? You know Peaky Promise? You ever seen that? Do you guys do that in Philippines? Well, our Pakistani friends, when I said this, I said, hey, I said, we're good friends. You Peaky Promise me. And they said, what? Their eyes got really big. And they said, they said in the Philippines, we do this when we are someone's enemy. <laughs> and, and what is it? Why do you do it? What does it mean? It cuts it off. It's like, we will never be friends again, and they will do this. So it's almost a total opposite meaning there. And, uh, um, and it's because of these different cultures, right? Um, so that's important. As we look at God's word, we need to realize um, that we're entering into another time period. Um, it's not 2015. Um, and it's another cultural world, okay? So that's a, that's a part of why we talk about context there. Um, so as we talk about looking at God's word, checking it, when we first dig into a passage, there are certain questions that we want to ask. As we look at what does this passage um, just say? Um, what's, what's going on here? So we ask some investigative questions. Um, when you go and write a report about a place, what are some good investigative questions? We need to find out context. Let me see. Context. Did I spell that right? What are investigative questions? Simpler than this. Um, when we write like an essay or something, what, the things that we want to know about a situation are, they're normally our W words, right? There are who, there are what, there are where, what else? When, when and why. Right? So these are all words that will help give us um, clue in detail about the situation. How? How? Um, some, some kind, you can add how maybe. How doesn't, how doesn't quite fit with this. So, um, so these are important for us to look at um, to understand what is going on. When we talk about checking God's word, um, when we jump into a book, we want to know what, what is this book about? Who, who is this book written to? Where is it at? Um, who are the people involved? What's going on, right? Um, a lot of these New Testament books that we read, they're letters, right? Sometimes written to an individual, like in this case, right? Timothy. So it's a personal letter from this guy, Paul, right? And we have these other letters um, that are written to churches in specific cities um, that are addressing 
certain situations. Um, so sometimes understanding the why, understanding the why is a big deal. Um, why is this person writing this? Look here at, um, in 2 Timothy, where we just were. In, at the end of this letter, Paul, Paul gets to more of the why. As he's focused a lot on Timothy as, as a, Timothy, now you've got to man up. <laughs> he's passing the torch on to Timothy. It's a really great book on discipleship and just living your life for Christ. Um, but he gets as to why it is that he's writing this right now. Look here in verse uh, chapter 4 and verse uh, 6 and 7. He says, Timothy, he says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is closed. I fought the good fight, and I finished the race, and I have kept the faith. Um, he's telling Paul, or he's telling Timothy all these things about Timothy, you know, keep a clear head. Be sure to handle your opponents with grace. Empower others to be strong leaders. Be careful about your message. And the reason is why? Why is Paul thinking about it so much? Yeah, he says, because I'm going to die, Timothy. You know, he says, I'm not going to be here much longer. Uh, so Paul in his mind is thinking about, you know, what is the work I have left? <laughs> have those that I taught, are they able to teach others as I've taught them? Um, so his why behind that for Timothy is, you know, I'm going on. Um, I want you guys to keep doing what it is that I've done. So that's a, that's a big uh, picture for more of what's going on. It's important that we check out the scripture. As we look at, as we look at a book, normally, um, just look at the beginning is a, helpful, is a helpful part of that, right? Go to the beginning of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1, or 2 Timothy chapter 1. In verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, for the promise of life in Christ Jesus, verse 2, to Timothy. So it doesn't take, you know, a super detective. You don't have to be an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. to figure out that this is a letter, right, <laughs> from Paul to a guy, Timothy, basically, right? Go over to Colossians chapter 1. Can someone read verses 1 and 2 there? Mm -hmm. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. Mm -hmm. Very good. And then go over to uh, Ephesians chapter 1. Okay, and can you get verse 1 again there, Eric? Uh, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Okay, so as we see, as we, as we see this, um, oftentimes, even the same letter, as we zoom out, we can get a greater understanding of these things, of this who, this what, this where, this when. And uh, we have to read it in full to understand more of the why. One good thing to check along with this, so this is context, um, but also understanding, as we look at, as we look at it as a whole, um, we begin to wonder about the mood. What is the feel behind the letter? Put mood. Um, as you look at mood, for example, um, some of these letters, have you ever wondered why, like, why are some letters so short? Why are some books in the Bible so tiny? Um, you know, if you look at 2nd and 3rd John, it's a little itty bitty thing. <laughs> um, you know, Jude, uh, there's only, it's only one page oftentimes, right? Then you get into 1 Corinthians, 2nd Corinthians, this is a long thing. What's the deal there? Um, sometimes the mood is affected there. Um, we have the Gospels are a good example of this. Matthew, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, the first three are mainly about the same things happening, right? And John as a whole is the same. It's all this story of Jesus' life here on earth, right? But is the mood different? The mood is pretty different. And a part of it has to do with the context, who they were written to, right? Uh, Matthew, for example, the book of Matthew um, it quotes a lot of Old Testament in fulfillment of prophecy because it was written for the Jews to believe. When you look at Mark, the book of Mark, it's the shortest one, right? Um, because it was written to a Roman, a Roman group. So Jesus is a busybody. He's like a Bangkokian in the book of Rome. Uh, he does a miracle, boom, he's gone. He does this, boom, he's on the BTS again, boom, boom. So we see a really quick action book, right? 
Um, so as we look at mood, um, it helps us also understand more about these things also. So um, I just want to point out as we look at God's word, sometimes we need to take a zoom back, right? Um, so that we don't take verses out of context because that can happen. Sometimes if we just jump in and we don't look at what's going on, um, why, is it, why is it that the original author wrote this? Um, we, can, we cannot understand. Some, some books of the Bible like this, it's a letter. Um, so a lot of it is practical, right? But some parts of scripture are prophetic, right? Um, there's prophetic imagery. Sometimes the Bible is poetry, and poetry isn't to be interpreted literally, right? And if we take things like that out of context, it can get tricky. Um, we have examples of this in the Bible. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. What's going on here in, in Matthew chapter 4 and in, in Luke chapter 4, we see the same thing at the beginning of the chapter. We see Jesus. Jesus is in the desert, right? And he's being tempted. He's being tempted by um, Satan. And what does, he use, what does Jesus use as his, as his weapon against Satan? He uses the word of God, right? Um, so we know this is, a, this is a big part of why it's important for us to have God's word on our hearts so that we can stand against Satan and his tactics. And that's true. Um, but we see also, we see kind of a surprise. Um, when you think about it, when you, see, uh, when you see Jesus out there, you know, he's weak, he's been fasting, um, and Satan comes up to him, and it's almost like Jesus pulls out his mighty sword or his lightsaber of God's word, right? And the devil's not able to stand against that. But then there's a surprise. Look here in verse, chapter 4, look here in verse 5. So it says in verse 5, it says, Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, um, by, the, by the way, the devil is really powerful. Crazy things are going on here. It says the devil takes him up. Uh, so we see the great power of Satan here. So he took him up to the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. He said, if you are the son of God, he says, throw yourself down for it is written. He will give his angels orders concerning you and they will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Now what happened here? There's a lot of, uh, sometimes I read the Bible and I write a question mark next to a verse and I say, what's happening? Um, as you really think about it, you know, and when I look at verse like this, like, what is happening? And you see Satan's powerful. He's teleporting Jesus to somewhere. Um, that's weird enough. But then right here it says, for it is written, he will give his angels orders concerning you. Um, what is the devil doing? He's quoting scripture. <laughs> you know, sometimes we have those movies where there's a demon possessed person and, you know, they go into, there's all the TV shows now. They go into the room and they're like, all right, this room's demon-possessed. We're going to take the Bible. And we show them the Bible. They're going to freak out, <laughs> um, right? And they see the person demon-possessed. Like, ah. But uh, here we see the devil is quoting the Bible. Um, I would imagine that Satan knows the Bible very well because, in a way, he's, he's been through all of it, right? He knows it all. So he quotes this verse, right? Um, he will give his angels orders concerning you and they'll support you with their hands so you will not strike your foot against a stone. So here's this little verse and I want us to look to this as an example because the devil, he does, he does these three steps right here basically. Well, he jumps some steps and I think that this is what we often do with the Bible. Sometimes we look at a verse and we say, okay, here's this here's this verse, just random verse, and we say, okay, now I want to apply it to my life, <laughs> right? Um, so for, for this, you know, the devil's picked this one up. He says, he has these angels. It says, all right, basically, if you're out, there's these angels, God will grab you, and you won't hit the ground, right? Um, so what is the devil's application? What is, what is he hinting at to apply here? What did he say in verse 6? He says, if you're the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. <laughs> throw yourself down is Satan's application here, right? He says, if you throw yourself down, you're going to get caught by these angels. 
Because the Bible says whenever we throw ourselves off of giant things, angels come and save us. Is this real application? Is that what this passage you think is about? No, it's not, it's not, about, it's not about this. So part of what we need to do when we look at one verse alone is we need to, we need to zoom out, right? We need to ask those questions we asked a second ago. Um, some of your Bibles help, help you do this. Um, but we can see that this, this verse that Satan quotes, it comes from Psalms 91. Do you want to turn to Psalms 91? It comes from Psalms 91. 91. Mm-hmm. And what kind of writing are the books of Psalms? They're songs, right? Or what else? We can say songs or poetry, right? Um, so oftentimes the things that the writers in the Psalms are saying, they're poetic, they're poetic uh, descriptions of events, right? Um, so that means it's not literal things happening. And this is important because some people will twist scripture um, that are sometimes prophetic or poetic um, and try and make it literal. Um, and that can be dangerous. That's what the devil's done right here. Um, so look here at the beginning, uh, Psalms 91, um, we see here, this is basically a poem, right? Um, and it's a poem about, as we look at the, look at the who, the what, it was probably written by David, like many of the other Psalms. And as David wrote Psalms, what was he normally doing? What was David often doing in his life? <laughs> huh? Okay, he played the harp when he was young, right? Who's, who's David. You don't know who David is? King. What do we know about him? King. He was king. Did he become king like very smoothly? Was it easy? No. No, why not? He had to fight battles. He had to fight battles against who was it? What was like the big problem there? He had enemies, right? Because of the king before him. Saul, right? Did Saul like David very much? No. no. David. He's always trying to kill him. <laughs> um, Exactly, even his family. So oftentimes David's kind of on the run, and some of your Bibles will even line this up for you at times, but there's certain times where David's on the run, people are trying to kill him, and because he's an artistic person, basically, um, he would write a poem about it. Um, David would write a poem, he'd write out his prayer in a way um, as a call out to God. You know, God help me at this dark point in my life. And sometimes we do the same thing, right? When we're at a scary place, we pray up to God. Um, basically in Psalms, we see people doing just that. So look here at Psalms 91, verse 1. It says, uh, The one who lives under the protection of the Most High God dwells in the shadow of the Almighty. In verse 2, he says, I will say to the Lord, you're my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. In verse 4 um, is a verse that, um, as I read it one day, it inspired me to make that t-shirt, right? It says, He will cover you with his feathers, and he will take refuge under his wings. For his faithfulness will be a protective shield. So as you read all of Psalms, Psalms 91, you can go back and do it again. But as you begin to look at mood, as you look at the theme, um, what, if, for the most part, would you guess that Psalms 91 is about? So you look at these first couple of verses. We saw what we read earlier. They come from verse 11. It says, For he will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you in all your ways. They will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. What for the most part is this psalm about? Say, say that again. It is also the healing powers, like the certain. Uh, I don't think that it's about necessarily um, about that. What? Uh, he's trying to encourage himself that he's going to get protection from God. Yes, it's about protection from God. That God, that God is my refuge, right? Um, so we have this overall this vision, right, from these, uh, from Jesus himself, and, and there's angels that are helping explain things to him. So it says in verse 9, it says, So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. You know, there's this message. He wants to know what it is. And he, he said to me, Take it 
and eat it. He says, you can take it. He says, go ahead, eat it. Fill your stomach with this, with this message. And he says, it will be bitter in your stomach, but it will be sweet as honey in your mouth. So in Ezekiel, he had this good, sweet message. Um, but here for John, he says, eat this. It's going to taste sweet at first, but it's going to be bitter also in your stomach. Um, this has to do with the revelation, the message that John was having to deal with. Because as we encounter God's word, um, as we truly open ourselves up to it, as we meditate on it, um, a lot of it's sweet. It's good, right? We like it. But at the same time, the gospel is powerful. As it sheds light to sin, man, sometimes it cannot sit well with our stomach, right? Uh, for John, he was hearing about uh, he was hearing about what was to come uh, of disruption and different things. And, and man, as he heard that, as he understood the gravity of those events, um, it hurt him, right? Um, this painful message. It was good news, yes, in many ways, but at the same time, wow, um, there was pain there. Look here at Hebrews, Hebrews chapter four. And can someone read verses 12 and 13 there? Uh, verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him, to whom we must give account. So as he, as the Hebrew writer, as he's talking about God's word, he compares it to a sword, right? And what does he say? He says it's like a double-edged sword, basically. He says it's going to, it's going to cut you up. It's going to divide you. You're going to be, you're going to be laid bare before it, right? What's hidden before God? Nothing. Nothing is hidden, right? And God's word is that power. Uh, where it enters into our lives, into our hearts. And many times it's awesome, right? It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful experience as we're transformed um, into a son Jesus. But in reality, it can be a painful thing as we have sin exposed, as we have to change our lives. Um, that's not an easy process, right? So he says, no, it's going to cut in. It's going to break into bone and marrow, basically. And he's talking about as we are exposed to it, yeah, it's sweet. But then sometimes like, oh, wow, <laughs> this is requiring a lot of me. Um, as the rich young man was called to sell everything he owned, right? He said, oh, it sunk right in. He said, ow, pierced his heart. He said, I can't, I can't do that. Uh, so as we get real with the gospel, as we look at it, we understand what it's really mean. As we really eat it, allow it to sink in. It's good, yes, it's sweet on the mouth, right? But if we open our hearts up to it, sometimes it can be a painful thing as we get real with it, right? Um, but that's important. That's an important step is meditating on it, um, understanding it, because it can change us. Um, so lastly, um, lastly, the step that we often that, that we often miss, what I what I mentioned here, is the so what. As we talk about questions there of uh, what is it about? What is it saying? Um, the last one is so, the so what? What does it mean for me? What do I do? What do I do with this today? Um, I think that a lot of people have this question just about the Bible in general and world re a lot of world religions are old religions, right? Does this mean anything for us here today? We looked at a few examples uh, already. The answer is yes, right? As we allow it, as we allow to meditate on it, I think we'll realize that this thing, just like the Hebrew writer says, is that there's something special about God's word. It says it's living. It's living and active. So as we encounter it, um, when I encounter it, it's not going to be the same as it is for Nicole, right? It's not going to be the same as it is uh, for Gulshan. Um, we encounter God's word in different ways. It speaks to all of us. As it cuts to all of our hearts, basically. So we can take away something fresh and new that we can walk away with. So, um, so the step of eat it, unleash it. Um, as we look at God's word, I think it's important that we that we ask ourselves, so what? And not just so what, um, as to why does it matter, but so what? Um, so what am I going to do? Um, and thinking about, as we look at this, um, what am I going to do in my life that has to do
do with what what I just encountered. Um, so we see so we see it. Uh, we allow it to sink in. What am I going to do about this? Because I think sometimes uh, sometimes we kind of pigeonhole ourselves, or or we get used to only wanting to feed ourselves in the way that we want to be fed. Um, turn back with me to Second Timothy. In 2 Timothy in chapter 4. <clears throat> Paul tells Paul tells Timothy, I want to read a few of these verses here. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse, starting in verse 1, he says, Before God in Christ Jesus, who is going to judge the living and the dead by his appearing and his kingdom, says, I solemnly charge you. So Paul is, you know, Paul is wanting Timothy to understand the gravity uh, of a disciple. He says, I'm he says, before God and Jesus, in the living kingdom that we're a part of, he says, I'm charging you, Timothy. Verse 2 says, proclaim the message. Or your, your translation might say, preach the gospel. He says, persist in it, whether convenient or not. Um, sometimes it's not easy to deal with God's word. He says, I want you to do it whether it's easy or not. He says, rebuke, correct. And encourage with great patience in teaching. And look here what he says in verse 3. He says, For the time will come when they will not tolerate sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, will accumulate teachers for themselves, because they have an itch to hear something new. And they will turn away from hearing the truth, and will turn aside to myths. He says, But as for you, you keep a clear head about everything, and your hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Um, so Paul's going to understand, you know, I want you to carry on, carry on this message. And he's talked for a while about these people living out, they call themselves Christians, but he says, but they deny the power of God. And he says, have nothing to do with them, right? Um, and he says, they're going to gather up these people um, that, that they want to just hear lessons from. Um, and it makes me think of today. <laughs> um, you know, we can, whoop, you know, I can have people that I say, they're my favorite preacher. Uh, and I just go, Poop, I want to hear their message. Um, and sometimes when this happens, we can get a, we can get a uh, pendulum swing of idea of God's word. If I say, oh yeah, I really like God's word when it's all about love and love and grace and stuff like this. So when I, and I, and I want to read only passages about this. Um, and and when, I go to a, when I go to a seminar, when I go to a church, I don't want to hear him speak about this. <laughs> we can have this happen, right? My father-in-law, Michelle's dad, told me about the time where he, he talked with this woman, and um, Paul talks about admonishing one another. The word admonish, the scripture idea is we bring to light sin. Sometimes we commit sins, we don't know we're sins, right? When we willfully do something bad, uh, we know we're walking into it, right? But have we made mistakes in the past that, at the time, we didn't understand were that bad? Sometimes, yeah, like when you're a little kid, you know, sometimes you steal something the first time, and you're like, you know, you're like me, your dad bops you. Boy, what are you doing? Don't take things, you know? You're like, oh, okay, it's not mine. Um, so, you know, but someone has to tell you, basically, right? Paul is talking about, you need to be admonished. Um, and it's really not a good feeling thing. Well, my, my front law told me about something, you know, he he pointed something out in scripture. This woman had this idea of scripture. He said, no, it's not what the Bible teaches. You know, they were looking at it, and she says, yeah, it's there. You know what she did? She tore it out. She tore it out and tossed it aside. <laughs> she said, not in my Bible. And then she only says, that's not in my Bible. Um, and we can't do this. We can't pick and choose what we want God's word to be, right? God's word is God's word. Um, but sometimes the past we've done is had a pendulum swing of, oh, it's all about grace and truth, or, oh, it's all about helping other people or serving, or it's all about uh, exposing sin in our lives, and we shift to one end or the other. But in reality, we need to take all of it, right? We need to take the full revelation of God. Um, we don't get to choose the part that we want, and we don't just surround ourselves with only things that we want to hear. <clears throat> this is a part of why it's important that we gather um, in God's word in a communal way like this. It's good we have a teacher like me up here, but to an extent, wow, um, it can be much more beneficial as we gather together and we look at God's word in group, in community, in community. Historically, this is how it was done. Because they didn't have, everyone didn't have a Bible, right? 
in Luke 4, as Jesus reads from Isaiah, he uses a scroll, right? And there's only you know, one copy, uh, one copy of these things, and they would read in community. Um, so we talked we talked before about we talked before about how we encounter the church in different ways. We encounter God's word in different ways. We do it, and least important that we do it individually, right? Um, but at the same time, it's good to do. It's good to do with just a few people. Where we can really dig in. We say, hey, hey, man, you know, I want us to just sit down and look at this more. Uh, what do you think this means? Uh, Eric, let, let's just, the, the few of us, let's look at this. Um, our two or threes, right, our micro communities. And it's also good to do um, in our small groups. Um, you guys have your, your Philippine Bible study, you have your study at Sign legal, you guys stay together in your homes. We do this with our families. Um, we have songs at the church. Whereas we sit down and we just look at a passage together. Um, a great practice is just going through a book, just like we looked at. You can take a book like 2 Timothy um, or James, and you can go through chapter by chapter together. Um, or on an individual basis, you can read it you know, once every day. Um, there's books like 2 Timothy. You can sit down and read all of 2 Timothy in one sitting, right? Maybe in, a, maybe in less than 20 minutes, I bet. Um, so individually, you're reading it together. And then as you come together with two or three people, you can say, hey, let's look at this. And you can read uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1 just together, that first chapter. Or, or in your small group, read it together. And as you go through it, you guys talk about these things together. You say, okay, what is it? Uh, what is it saying? What's going on here? What is it really about as you meditate on it? Um, you look at, you look at, oh, what's going on? You see that Timothy is struggling with this opposing group, right? Um, and then you look at simple passages. Um, you zoom in at ways and say, okay, what am I going to do about it? Um, what are we going to do? Uh, look what he said, uh, what Paul says here in verse, verse 5. He says, but as for you, Timothy, all these things are going on. He says, but you, you keep a clear head about everything. You endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. And as you look at passages like this, you can't help but realize, you know, this was originally a call for this guy, Timothy, but man, it can apply to me today, right? And sometimes maybe I have things going on, you know, there's someone that needs help, that needs service. Um, I realize that, oh God, why are you asking so much for me? <laughs> got to help my family with this, we need to help the church with this, I got this going on at work. Uh, we need that simple reminder of keep fighting that fight, right? Do the hard work that you've been called to. Um, so what am I going to do about it? You know, I'm going to buck up. Um, I'm going to do what God's put before me. Um, this is something that we can do that I want to challenge us to do um, in our groups. I want to challenge you guys at, at the office sometimes. You know, you can give Eric a break. <laughs> give Bernard a break. You can say, hey, we're going to look at this passage. And we're going to ask these three questions. Let's check it out. What's going on? Who is this? What do we know about Rome? Um, if you're in the book of Romans, what's going on? Um, and you eat it. Wow, you know, I've never noticed this one little verse. Sometimes little verses pop out, right, as we do this. Um, so you might say, oh, as I was reading this as, on my own, I noticed this. Um, and then you can go away and you can all share. Um, you all share. Um, what am I going to do about it? Because we live the same thing, and sometimes as we saw God's word, as it pricks all of our hearts differently, that sword, and then we can come away with a different application on our own. Um, so my challenge today is I want us to be um, unleashing God's word in our lives. As Eric shared this morning, how the world um, can know that we are his disciples by our love, by our actions, right? As we're living out our faith. And I think that historically, we've done a bad job done a bad job, right? Because we have the power of God in our hands, but we've confined it in many ways. We need to open it up. We need to free it in our, in our lives. So this is important as we talk about uh, church growth, and as we talk about engaging our cities, our communities, uh, and digging deep in that culture. First, we've got to dig deep into God's Word um, so it can transform us, so we can learn more about how the world around us needs to be transformed. Um, if you don't have any questions, Questions there? If some of you have the Elemental of Faith booklets, um, I don't know if you remember that Elemental of Faith booklets. I didn't print this out because it's already in there. If you already have that, and I have this explained in the Elemental of Faith booklet. But I can maybe uh, print out this for next week also. 
um, just this reminder, you can keep it in your Bible. You know, as I look at this, be sure that I check it, I'm going to eat it, um, really chew on it, then unleash it. Uh, make it real. And this is a powerful thing because we can do it with anyone. We can do this everywhere. Um, you can invite your friends, your coworkers, and say, hey, you know, me and my buddy Eric and I, uh, on certain times, like, we just get together. We eat Goitia, Terminal 21. And then when we talk about, we talk about this. This is something you can invite a not yet Christian to, as well as, you know, someone like Lone. Um, it's a way that we that we call others alongside of us in our discipleship, okay? Um, so let's uh, check it, eat it, and unleash it as we approach this word. Um, I'll lead us in prayer and we'll be done. Right?